All right, welcome to what I hope is the final lesson of, uh, of the French Revolution, final part of the lesson. Uh, we're going to be talking about essentially the disillusionment of the French Republic and the beginning of the dictatorship or uh, the, uh, the imperial dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte and just how it went from this republic to a dictatorship. By the way, from an American point of view, something we are very afraid of here. Uh, getting to the point where we feel like things are so crazy that we just need someone to just take control like a Napoleon and fix everything or Julius Caesar. Our, our entire society is based off of not doing that because we realize that individual liberties will suffer at that point. By the way, just a little plug in the idea of, of American mentality there. <clears throat> but we get this idea of thinking from the past, learning from the past here, and hopefully understanding the world around us. So we ended la the last part of the lesson talking about the reign of terror and how bad that was. Uh, and I wanted to talk more about it, by the way, but the, the lesson was going a bit too long and I apologize. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, please look it up. It is a crazy time period. Just really quickly, though, if you've seen uh, Batman Dark, Dark Knight Rises, the third of that whole Batman series, that entire movie is actually based off the French Revolution. Like the part where they have the convicts putting people on trial and saying you mistake this, this isn't a trial, this is uh, like a sentencing or whatever you're saying, like basically you're guilty no matter what, we just want to kill you. That's kind of like the way the trials went during the reign of terror. Like, if you show up here, you're dead anyways. You're, we're not going to take a risk that you might be an anti-revolutionary. So anyways, just wanted to put that a little bit in there. There's a lot more I could talk about as well and just how the reign of terror, what the reign of terror was like and how bad it was. Um, <clears throat> but moving on, once the reign of terror ends, Robespierre is killed. Uh, they come up with a new constitution, so essentially their third constitution in a matter of like six years, uh, where it establishes just a representative body it called the Directory. Now, right there I say it was made up of weak and corrupt men who argued all the time. There was actually a lot of good men here, but it was there was enough of these weak and corrupt men that just ruined it all, and they could never come to a majority and they could always get bought off. <clears throat> There's a lot of bribing going on. And because you just didn't you didn't really have any type of executive leader like a president just saying, nope, we're gonna go this way, or they're constant and they they didn't put good rules in place to say, hey, this is how we can move forward, maybe with like a two thirds vote type thing or two thirds majority, like the United States Constitution has. The directory is just a massive failure. And people realize that okay, maybe we have representation, but they're getting nothing done. And they all seem corrupt, like this is just awful. Uh, the directory just sucks. By the way, I have a nice video I like to show on this one, but in this situation I can't. Um, so I hope I'm explaining this well enough. But in comes, <coughs> sorry, in comes a guy named Napoleon Bonaparte. I need to give you a little bit of his background. Uh, Napoleon, um, <coughs> excuse me, well, well, he's a huge national hero at this point, but how did he get there? He's one of those kids where if you look at the beginning life of Napoleon, he's one of those, it's inspirational almost in a way, the beginning of his life. But here's a kid who comes from an island called Corsica, which is south of France, which they actually, the French had just gotten. Uh, I can't remember who they got it from, Spain, Italy, one of the Italian kingdoms, kingdoms I think. And so everybody from Corsica was kind of looked down on, like, you're not really French. And a lot of the Corsicans are thinking, no, we, we like being part of France. We want to prove ourselves. Napoleon, as from a family, was one of these, like, we want to show that we're as French as anybody else type thing, even though we're from Corsica. So his parents were fairly well-to-do aristocrats from Corsica. And they get him sent to military school in France. This is all before the revolution and stuff, by the way. Because he's grown up. But because he wasn't like everybody else he was picked on a lot by both teachers and uh, his fellow students but instead of just kind of a woe is me attitude he was more of like this no i'm gonna i'm gonna do well whether you like it or not type of attitude just a very type a personality which understandable turns into a dictator later you kind of have to be a type a personality to to, to achieve that if that's your goal in life um but um uh, as the Enlightenment comes about, and he starts growing up and learning those. He loves in the Enlightenment. He loves Enlightenment ideals. Uh, he loves uh, individual, I shouldn't say individual liberties. He loves the idea of liberty in general, but when he becomes a dictator, he... <laughs> I'll get to that later, I'm sorry. So, 
Uh, but he's a young idealist. And he, it seems, you know, a guy who definitely, especially when the revolution starts and the republic comes, he sees himself as an idealistic defender of the liberties of France. So, and um, anyways, I should have had that up there earlier. Basically, his star starts on the rise in what's called the Siege of Toulon. It, it's a town that the British, on the coast of France, that the British had actually taken over. And he was sent with a detachment of the French army to uh, expel them. Now, there's like 3,000 British soldiers there, and the French send just 1,200. And the British have a couple ships with lots of cannons, and the French just have a few cannons. Uh, the thing is, Napoleon was actually in charge of the cannons. That was He was the artillery commander of this. Now, he wasn't the commander of the whole force. The commander of the whole force was kind of a dunce. Not very good of a strategist. By the way, I haven't said this yet, but Napoleon, rightfully so, has gone, has gone down his history one of the greatest military commanders of all time. Deservedly so, he is. So, <clears throat> uh, they get there. The French just do a frontal assault on the city, and the British easily repel them. And so the French retreat in disarray. Napoleon is actually the guy that says, no, guys, we can win this. He's able to get round up about 500 soldiers, just 500. Goes up to a hilltop above Toulon, stations his artillery there, and starts firing down on the British. The British can't get their cannons to face high enough to fire back. So they try to do a frontal assault uphill <clears throat> against Napoleon. He had a great geographic advantage over them. And he just rains fire down on them. And the British realize, oh, we're screwed, and he can fire on our ships from that position. We really need to command of that hilltop. Why didn't we think of that? So the British actually leave, and Napoleon single-handedly takes back Toulon. Um, so that's kind of where he gets prominence, like, oh, wow, he turned a defeat into a victory type guy. And that, by the way, that becomes his thing for the next two decades of his life. He can take anything that looks like a defeat and turn it into a victory, until his last two defeats. <laughs> but anyways... Um, he then really gets a lot of prominence when he uh, outnumbered against a royalist rebellion. I didn't talk about this in the last lesson. I'm trying to keep things simple. but uh, About 20,000 people, mostly peasants actually, that realized they'd rather have a king back because the directory sucks, uh, decide to march on Paris. And he, with his about three to 4,000 troops, kind of annihilates. He kills a lot of them. But he's seen as a defender of the republic. And he is a defender of the republic. Uh, defender of the Republic. This is sounding like Star Wars. Well, yeah, Star Wars gets a lot of their stuff from not to say this part, this idea of like long live the Republic type stuff. So, anyways, um, he then, after his two successes there, he's like, okay, maybe he can take control of the entire French army and win against, you know, the other big arms from Austria and stuff like that. So he takes control against of the French army going against the Austrians in Italy, and he wins against all odds. He does so because he does this famous cross in the Alps, gets behind the Austrians. They didn't think that he could have done it. Um, basically, it's not just that. I actually like showing a lot of little videos that are on Napoleon on this one. Uh, where, yeah, he just, he, not only does he show himself as a military genius, but he also leads from the front. I mean, he's the guy at the front of his men in some of these cases, leading the charge, carrying the flag. And he develops this idea that he's not only a brilliant general and that he loves his men, but he's also invulnerable. Like, it seems, like people are dying all around him, but he seems to never get hit. You know, it did seem like he had a bit of divine providence to him. So he's, he's starting to get this myth around him. Like he's not just this great idealist and defender of the Republic that maybe God has sent him type thing. So um, he basically embarks, after his success in Italy, he embarks on a campaign against the British in Egypt. This ends in failure, uh, mainly because the French Navy gets destroyed by the British Navy, and uh, the French lose their supplies. The thing is, is at this point, the people of France have had so, they're so ticked off at the directory, the government of France at this point, and Napoleon hears about this as he's trapped in Egypt, that he smuggles himself out of Egypt, is able to uh, run the blockade of the British Navy and gets back to France, but he leaves his army there. This is one of those like kind of like oh, uh, black marks on his list. He does leave his army in in uh, Egypt, and they do end up eventually lose to the British down there, have to surrender. <clears throat> um, but when he comes back to France, he successfully leads what's called a coup d'état. Anyways, I put this picture up here. Um, and when he runs this coup d'état, uh, basically what he does is. He replaces the government of the Directory of France, the, the government that is run by the Directory, 
with what's called a cons uh, consulship, where there's three people in charge, kind of like the tri triumvirs of ancient Rome, who all have equal power. But Napoleon is known as the first consul. And really when it comes down to it, he was the guy in charge. He was making all the decisions. People trusted him because he could get things done and he'd wins. The other two guys are just there. They're just kind of like voices that you didn't really need to care about. Napoleon realizes this, and he realizes, I don't want to share power with these guys. You know, I know what's best for France. So he puts it up to a vote. This was a vote. And over 80% of France legitly votes emperor, and Napoleon is emperor. He didn't need to cheat on this one. He knew that they would vote for this. A vast majority of the French population would vote for Napoleon as emperor. So it becomes emperor of the French. Now, uh, just a warning, I told you guys this in the very first video that I would not have as much to write. Uh, when it comes to your notes, I would not have much on my PowerPoints here because I usually do other things. But uh, again, I apologize, but you guys are going to have to now take notes off of what I'm saying, not to say what, you, what is written up here. Um, I'll just have pictures to help you maybe visualize it, and that's it. Again, I apologize. So, uh, and basically, one of the things Napoleon does when he becomes emperor is he crowns himself emperor. He actually invites the Pope. The Pope is sitting there. And usually Popes are the ones to crown people kings or emperors because, you know, like, you know, here's, God has granted you to be you know, king. And Napoleon, more of an enlightenment mindset, says, I brought you up here just to kind of witness this, but, you know, I'm here because of the people voting me in and what I have done myself, kind of tooting his own horn. So he takes the crown and puts it on his own head, saying that I did this and the people of France did this, not God. So, and then he turns around and what this picture is, is showing is that he then crowns his wife, Josephine, as, as Empress of the French. So, um, it's at this point where megalomania does start taking hold of Napoleon. If you don't know what megalomania is, and you might want to write this down in your notes. I'm not going to test you on this, I don't think. But megalomania is this idea that you become addicted to power. And then you start feeling like you need, that you know better. And of course, whatever you say must be the right way that things should be done. So it should just be done. Anybody that disagrees with you, um, well, they must be evil. Uh, they just don't, they don't understand. And this is megalomania. It's kind of a form of craziness, I guess you could say. Well, then the point is not crazy. He's just afraid of losing his power and feels like he's right all the time. So, just to kind of give you this idea of this mentality of kind of the way that Napoleon was before to this megalomania that starts taking hold of him and something that we're very afraid of as Americans maybe happening to us at some point. By the way, we're not... I'm not going to comment on this one. So, uh, at least on the American side of things. But there's Napoleon as he was made first consul after the coup d'etat. You know, it's... Uh, and here's Napoleon, another painting of himself, not too long afterwards, as emperor. I mean, just in those paintings, he commissioned both those paintings. That isn't like other people doing it of him. That's the way he wants to be portrayed. You're seeing his personal mentality there, his change of thought process from a young idealist to uh, an imperialist type of dictator. So uh, the thing is, is that even though I'm talking about how he's becoming a bit megalomaniacal and stuff like that, Still, there's a lot of things that we'd sit here and say, well, I agree with that. You know, we just never want to have a dictator type thing. For instance, he is all for public education. Everybody deserves the opportunity to be educated and, and to have a good life. In order to do that, you need to have a public education. You need to have an education. You know, only people before this that could afford it could get it. You know, like his family. His family could pay for his him going to military school. What about those that can't? How many how many great people that could really add into France and make it a great place don't get the chance to do so because they weren't afforded an education? You know, as an American today, we sit there and look at that and say, that's yeah, we can agree with that. Uh, but he does force this. He doesn't give anybody really a choice. He just says, you will go to school. Um, yeah. uh, he organized an efficient tax code, a tax code that actually is very fair, more fair than a lot of tax codes today. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to go into this one. If you want to research the Napoleon tax code, go ahead. But he did a good job. Uh, now, oh, I forgot to talk about this last time. I apologize. This was on your note packet too. Uh, during the reign of terror, the Catholic Church was outlawed. And in many cases, a lot of church officials were beaten and stuff like that. Like the church was really heavily persecuted. 
Um, he's like, no, you know, you've known, you know, we need the Catholic Church here. It's good to have religion, essentially. But not with political power like they did before. No such thing as a first state anymore. So he actually protects the Catholic Church, which, by the way, Catholic Church is very happy about, especially in France. And a lot of people who are religious in France are thinking, like, finally, someone who's willing to essentially protect my my desire to be religious, essentially. So, by the way, it's not... Uh, yeah, a lot of people did view it that way. And again, there's more to it than just that. But uh, anyways, he also reasserts, he's like, you know what, even though I'm emperor, I'm still going to enforce the Declaration of Rights. But this is the whole thing, though, is that he says, you will believe this. I'm not going to give you a choice. You have to, because I know better than you. Uh, he comes up with a good court system that's more fair. And all these changes are what are called the Napoleonic Code. Um... So in your notes, you know, we're not a code. I don't give you a ton of space. I apologize, but this is where all this needs to go. And so essentially what Napoleon does basically is forces everybody to become more progressive. And you know, looking back on this, you look at this and think, well, yeah, a lot of these are good ideas. And a lot of those ideas we have today, uh, still to this day, or <laughs> wish we had still to this day, like an efficient tax code. Um, but where it kind of goes wrong is he doesn't give anybody a choice on this one. So where's the liberty in wanting to do this when you're forced to do it? And the correlation I always like to make in these type of situations is it's kind of like your mom telling you to clean your room versus you clean your room yourself. It's a good thing to do. Cleaning your room is a, is a good thing to do. If anybody here is arguing about that, cleaning your room is a good thing to do. But when your mom tells you, it feels like a sense of tyranny. Like, your mom's always telling me to clean my room. I should... You know, be quiet, mom, and just get pissed off at your mom. And how dare she tell me what to do when I don't want to do it, even if it's a good thing to do. But when you choose to clean your room, you're like, oh, my room's dirty. You actually like it. Uh, you know, you have fun, in a way, cleaning your room because it's you doing it. You have the control. And that's the same thing here. Even though Napoleon has great ideas, or the Napoleonic Code, you could say, are great ideas, because he forces it on everybody. He doesn't just force it on France. Uh, the French actually take this up mostly of being okay with it because they're 10 years in the revolution, 15 years in the revolution at this point. Uh, but he conquers all of Europe. I'm going to talk about that in the next few slides. But he conquers all of Europe. And he forces this on the rest of Europe too. Places like Austria and Prussia and Spain and Italy and Denmark and Sweden. Um, he forces these ideas on them. And even though they're, you can look at it and say they're good ideas, they're like, no, we're being forced to do this by the evil Napoleon. Now, how dare this be a good thing? Uh, you know, just because they associate with Napoleon, a guy they don't like, they think it's an evil, all this stuff is bad. So, yeah, you can definitely make some comparisons to that, to modern day politics. Anyways, I'm not going there though. So, okay, but moving on. This is a picture of Napoleon after being emperor for a while and all the stuff he had to go through. And you can definitely see the raggedness that's kind of taken hold. Basically, I just said this earlier, but he conquers all of Europe, and the only nation that actually is standing up to him is Great Britain. That is it. Why is Great Britain able to stand up against him? They're an island nation, and they had a better navy than he had. Um, just to, the last bit of what I'm going to explain about Napoleon is on here. In fact, most of your notes are going to be off of this. The notes for this whole thing on Napoleon are going to be off of this map, so just I'll explain as best as possible. Basically, when Napoleon becomes emperor, uh, the rest of Europe was like, how dare this person who is not of the type of noble blood you need to have to become king become an emperor? So they all decide to gang up on him. And this all culminates into what's called the Battle of Austerlitz, which is right here. Notice that is on your notes as well. Uh, Battle of Austerlitz is where basically all of, all of uh, Europe gangs up on Napoleon and he beats them. He's a military genius, like. If you want to read up on Austerlitz and how he wins it, it's actually kind of incredible. He loses a lot of guys still, but uh, but he beats everybody. Um, at that point after Austerlitz, he basically becomes a virtual control of all of Europe. He forces Austria and Prussia to become allies, but really can tell them what to do. Um, he, uh, places like Spain, any place you see in the light green, like Spain, uh, he gets tired of the monarchs there. Just because, not the idea that they weren't good. Well, I actually they weren't that great that's the whole idea the king of spain just couldn't trust him very well or napoleon didn't feel like he trust him because he just seemed incompetent um 
So he decides, I'm going to put my brother on the throne of France. That doesn't go over well, by the way. Spain ends up, or sorry, I said that wrong. He puts his brother on the throne of Spain. He makes his brother the king of Spain. In fact, he starts making all of his family members kings of different areas of Europe. Talk about a European imperial family going from ideas of liberty and self-governance to, hey, my family rules the world type thing. Uh, this did not go over well in Spain, by the way. Spain rebels immediately. Spain was actually a good ally of France throughout this whole thing, even under Napoleon. But when he tries to take over Spain like that, they rebel against him. And this becomes a major thorn in his side for the rest of his uh, his emperorship, I guess you say, of Europe. One of the reasons for his downfall later on, actually, is just the problems in Spain. Not the main reason, though. Russia is the main reason. I'll show that in a second. So, Battle of Austerlitz. He takes control of Europe. Um, he wants to invade Britain, has a plan to do so, but his, his navy is destroyed down here, what's called the Battle of Trafalgar. So under Trafalgar, you need to write down that the French, the combined French and Spanish navies are destroyed by, um, uh, by the British Navy uh, under, the command, uh, the, under the leadership of a guy named Horatio Nelson. By the way, from the British perspective, Horatio Nelson is one of the greatest heroes of all time of British history. Because he saved them from Napoleon. He made it so that Napoleon could not invade them. Napoleon, mad that he could not take over Britain as well, um, then decides to initiate what is called the Continental System. Now, the Continental System is this uh, idea that nobody in Europe is allowed to trade with the British. So he wants to starve them into submission. No trade, no money for you guys. And he gets everybody to do so. The one country that was kind of didn't want to do this was Russia. So he has a big battle against Russia. It's called the Battle of Elba, I think. It's not even on here on this map, I'm sorry. But it was a pretty bloody battle. I think like 75,000 people total died in that one uh, between the two sides. Uh, but, but Napoleon basically beats Russia to the point where Russia has to agree to the continental system. So if you notice, Russia isn't in one of these colors uh, because it really wasn't directly controlled by Napoleon like everybody else was. And this is uh, the British actually later on, years later, or in 1811, 1812, um, <clears throat> convince Russia to break the continental system, start trading with them. And Russia thinks, yeah, I think we'll do this because Russia was having, or sorry, because France was having such a hard time in Spain with the rebellion in Spain, Russia felt like now is the time to kind of get at Napoleon. So they break the continental system, start trading with Britain, and Napoleon is like, now I'm going to show them. So he organizes the largest army that arguably the world has ever seen at this point. You know, Chinese will argue they've had bigger armies before this, but uh, from the records, this is the largest army of all time. Napoleonic army, the numbers, I, I always see different numbers for this, anywhere from six to 800,000, somewhere in that range. Massive. It's not all French. It actually has a lot of Austrians and Germans and Italians in it. <clears throat> it's a full-on European army. And he invades Russia. Uh, the Russian armies tries to stop him a couple times. Uh, the big battle is a battle called the Battle of Borodino up there, if you're looking at that. Uh, and the French just squash the Russian army. So the Russians realize they have to kind of take a different route on trying to be Napoleon. When the French army gets to Moscow, the Russians abandoned it. Nobody was there. And Napoleon got there thinking, oh, sweet. I'll just camp here for the winter. I have all these buildings that we can stay warm in. In fact, there's a lot of food there as well, tons of food, and um, I could definitely survive with his army there for the winter. And then he'd march on the main cap, the, the other major capital of uh, Russia, which is St. Petersburg. It's not on that map, I'm sorry, but it's, it's kind of north, uh, northwest of Moscow on the coastline. Well, it's, it's right there. You know, we'll march there when, the, when it comes springtime. We'll, we'll, the thing is, is the Russians are counting on this one. They actually left hundreds of, how did you put this, uh, suicidal pyromaniacs <laughs> hidden all throughout Moscow. Once the French got kind of settled in, uh, the signal went out. And they all burned the city. They came out of their hiding and they lit all the, all the buildings on fire, especially the food stores, and just made Moscow a, a burning husk. And all of a sudden, Napoleon realizes, oh crap, I can't stay here. It's going to get cold soon. Russian winters are famous for being really cold. So he starts marching back, and unfortunately for Napoleon, the, the winter came on early. And over time, from the Russians kind of sporadically attacking his men 
his army and then just due to starvation and cold he walks back into uh, his empire with a little less i think it was a little less than 200,000 troops still alive after the destruction of the grand army which was called the grand army everybody rebels against him they have another major battle called the battle of leipzig uh right here um where napoleon is served his first defeat ever he gets defeated by everybody and he's sent into exile on a little island called Elba earlier. I think I said the Battle of Elba earlier. That was wrong. It does start with an E, the battle between Russia and France way earlier, like 1808, I think it was. But uh, Elba is this tiny island that they kind of, they it's kind of snubbing their noses at Napoleon saying, hey, you can be king of Elba. And uh, Napoleon's just like, oh, crap. Okay, so he stays there. Then he finds out later that the British are still kind of scared of him, and they're thinking of actually uh, imprisoning him or maybe even killing him. You know, they didn't even want him to stay there. So he actually escapes Elba, lands in southern France. Uh, the puppet, I should say puppet, the king of France at the time, they, they put a guy named King Louis XVIII on the, when I say they, all the nations of Europe make France monarchistic again. He sends an army down to stop Napoleon. He's like, oh crap, Napoleon's back? Go kill him. You know, he sends an army. The army gets down there, and a lot of the people in the army are people that served under Napoleon and actually liked him, and they they really hate the king. They're like, Napoleon or the king? We'll go with Napoleon. So that army sent sent to deal with Napoleon joins him instead, and he starts marching north towards Paris, uh, and people start flocking to him by the hundreds and thousands they flock, the French flock to him. You know, these people are like, hey, take my 16-year-old kid. He'll fight for you. Fight for the liberties of France. Bring back the other republic, please. The king sucks. And so Napoleon, like that, becomes emperor of France once again, leading into the very last battle, which is called the Battle of Waterloo, where all the nations come against him again. And this battle was hard fought. Uh, Napoleon, it's one of those things you look at, and if you're a Napoleon, I shouldn't say a Napoleon fan, but if you find yourself rooting for Napoleon, you're like, he could have won this one. But you could argue that the main reason why he lost this was his megalomania. Uh, and he just felt like he was supposed to win. So he just saw what he wanted to see. And when he was warned that the Prussians were coming, he just said, no, they're not. Well, that's, that's not the Prussians, essentially. You know, that, that's, that's my army coming. You know, he just wouldn't see it. It's almost like he was a, he was a little bit on the crazy side there. But it was the Prussians, and the Prussians turned the tide against him because it looked like he was about to win this one. So the Battle of Waterloo is the final defeat of Napoleon. This time, the British decided, we're not going to even let you near Europe. They exile him to an island called St. Helena off the coast of Africa. And he dies there seven years later. Uh, by the way, Waterloo is in the year 1815. He dies there in the early 1820s of uh, mercury poisoning. And it's actually found out more, not at the time, but now we know that that someone was feeding him uh, immense amounts of mercury in his food to poison him slowly so he would have a painful, painful death. Anyway, so that is Napoleon for you. Again, this is this lesson went a bit long. I apologize, but hopefully you enjoyed the, the stories of Napoleon. There's, there's a lot more there. I could be talk, telling you so much more, but hopefully this is a bit understandable. But just with the end of this whole lesson on the French Revolution and Napoleon, there's a few major lessons to get out of this. First off, Revolutions can go very, very bad. We look at the American Revolution and say, yeah, that went well overall. Yeah, it had some things that weren't so great about it, but it was it was a great thing and we're so thankful it happened. Then you look at things like the French Revolution, it's like, that didn't go over so well. And it eventually led into the dictatorship of Napoleon because people just wanted one person to fix everything because everything was going so bad. And then the, because one person was in charge, that one person, Napoleon, who seemed like he was an all right person in the beginning, turns into a megalomaniac who... Uh, in many ways kind of ruins the lives of everyone in the end because he just had to be right anyways uh, even though he had really good ideas when it came to enlightenment principles that we'd still agree with today anyways but those are some of these overall major les lessons and so just as you look at other things in history other revolutions um, wars of independence kind of take it with that eye you you have to look at the outcomes and a lot of the morals that go into it. Um, you know, to see, was that successful? Is that good or is that not good? So, just something to think about as you just kind of go on in life. And with that, this concludes uh, the unit on Enlightenment and Revolution. 
I'll see you in the next unit.